Okay, I think we can start. Uh, thank you all for your uh, your patience, uh, dear students, dear colleagues, friends, members of the of the general public, friends of the Hellenic Observatory. It's a great pleasure to welcome you to this public lecture, lecture by the Hellenic Observatory. This is our first public lecture of the, the new academic year. And I'm particularly happy to say that it's also my, the first lecture that I'm chairing in my new role at the Hellenic Observatory as the Eleftherios Venizelos Chair of Contemporary Greek Studies. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Um, but it's also a great pleasure because today with us we have two uh, uh, very great uh, figures of, uh, uh, in, in the study of uh, the Greek uh, economy. We have with us uh, perhaps the most uh, prominent uh, economist of the Hellenic community. He's not uh, from mainland Greece, but he still belongs to the uh, wider Hellenic community, Professor Sir Christopher Pisaridis, who holds the Regius Chair of Economics here at LSE, and he also has the Chair of European Studies at the University of Cyprus. And with him, uh, another very prominent figure of Greek uh, uh, economic research, academia, but also of politics and policy, Professor George Alogoskoufis, who is Professor of Economics at the Athens University of Economics. Economics uh, and business. Now, I think most uh, economists, or at least labor economists in the uh, audience, uh, would know Professor Pisaridis from his seminal work on the economics of matching and sales, frictions in the labor market, uh, the famous Morton and Pisaridis model, for which he also won the Nobel Prize in two, uh, 2010. Uh, but I think most people who are here in the audience would know uh, Professor Pisaridis for, for his work in what is known as the Pisaridis Commission. Um, which was set up by the previous administration in Greece, the first government by Kyriakos Mitsotakis, to provide a report on the uh, development plan and uh, reform path, uh, if you want, uh, uh, structural reforms uh, for Greece. Um, I've, I've said that many times in different panels and uh, venues that Greece is at the crossroads. It is again at the crossroads. Uh, the country just got an uh, investment uh, uh, status by the credit rating agencies. Uh, the economy was growing very fast. I think the latest data sort of uh, uh, are a bit bleak here, but unemployment has been declining for a very long time. Um, the tourist industry is growing, so there seems to be a lot of good things going on for Greece. Now, of course, we have said that uh, before the fires in Evros and in Rhodes and before the um, um, uh, Daniel Storm in, in, in Thessaly, uh, the picture we have today is a bit more, uh, if you want, less optimistic. Still, uh, the international media, but also discussions in policy in and outside Greece, uh, talk about Greece as a, a, a success in modernization, a success story. Uh, and of course, we talk about an executive state, a modern state, the Telico Kratos. Uh, we're not going to get, I think, and I hope, into the politics uh, of the discussion about whether this is a success story or not. In, 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 instead, our focus, I think, will be on assessing, assessing, uh, taking stock of whether country is and what needs to be done further, what has been achieved and what needs to be done further, in a way talking about the way forward. Uh, I mentioned uh, uh, Professor Pisaridis said the Pisaridis Commission, which produced a very well uh, received report on the Greek e e economy, so the lecture today is going to be more of uh, uh, taking stock exactly on that, uh, on what has been achieved and what needs to be done. Professor Pisaridis is very well placed to lead this discussion. He's not only world famous as a labor economist, but also perhaps less well known. He's done a lot of research and policy on macroeconomic issues. He has advised the government of Cyprus for the adoption of the euro, and he was member for a number of years of the Monetary Policy Committee in Cyprus. And of course, he's worked on issues of structural reform and macroeconomic performance, not only in the Commission uh, recently, but also in a project which was uh, very much uh, uh, the thing that in some way uh, uh, created the way for the Pisarius Commission, which was the initiative for the Greek economies for reform, which the Hellenic Observatory proudly supported um, with its own uh, resources. So he knows the macro, he knows the micro, the labor, the policy. He's very well placed to uh, discuss on that. And also he has the credentials for this. He is very well published, of course. His uh, flagship book on equilibrium unemployment theory is a standard reference in the literature. And he's published in the top journals in economics, American Economic Review, Quarterly Journal of Economics, Review of Economic Studies, and many others. 
I had a difficulty in summarizing his accolades and, and things, but I should mention a few. His honorary lifetime member of the American Economic Association, fellow of the Academy of Athens, of the British Academy, um, fellow of the Society for Labor Economists and the European Economic Association, of which he's been also president. He's also been president in the Council of National Economy in Cyprus. I could go on and on. Uh, one of the most impressive uh, things is that he's received over half a dozen honorary professorship and a dozen honorary doctorates, uh, so uh, quite impressive. And uh, besides the Nobel Prize, he has also received the Grand Cross of the Republic of Cyprus and, of course, a knighthood by the late Queen Elizabeth II. Uh, we'll hear from Professor Pisaridis in a minute, but uh, after that we'll have a discussion, a response by Professor George Alogoskoufis. Professor Alogoskoufis is equally well placed to take us through the topic of today, of course. He has experience not only in economic research, academic research on, on Greece, but also hands uh, on experience on policy, politics, policy uh, making. He was member of parliament, he was minister of finance for Greece in the period 2004-2009, <coughs> and of course he's written widely on the Greek uh, economy. Uh, like Chris Pisaridis, not only on labor market issues, where it was the uh, early steps of the career. I remember as a master student uh, reading the paper so you have with Alan Manning on unemployment uh, persistence, but his work increasingly looking at macroeconomic issues, uh, exchange rate regimes, micro macroeconomic stabilization, fiscal and external imbalances, the twin deficits, and so forth. Indeed, his publication record includes papers in the American Economic Review, the Journal of Political Economy, the Economic Journal, and many others. Uh, Professor Logoskoufis has also held the prestigious Konstantinos Karamalis chair at the Fletcher School in Tufts University in Boston, uh, and he, most famously perhaps, has been a research associate of the Hellenic Observatory for a long number of, of years. Uh, uh, the format of the event, we will have the lecture by Professor Pisaridis, then the discussion with Professor uh, Logoskoufis, and then we'll open it up for questions uh, by the audience. We will finish at 8 o'clock. Uh, and then for those brave enough to stay until 8 o'clock, there is a wine reception uh, just outside uh, yeah. the room here. So you're all welcome to join us and have a one-to-one -one perhaps with the, uh, the speakers if, if possible. The event is not currently being live streamed, but it may become live streamed uh, uh, soon. But I think it will or is being recorded and may, uh, subject to dealing with the technical problems be available as a podcast uh, through the Hellenic Observatory website uh, in a couple of days. For those of you that used to use Twitter and now use the X app, uh, our hashtag for the event is hashtag LSC Greece, so please use that uh, when you uh, tweet on the, on the event. I will stop here, I uh, don't want to take more of the time. Uh, uh, please join me in welcoming Professor Chris Prisadidis to the program. Thank you very much, Vasily. That was an uh, amazing introduction. I hope I live up to it. Um, as you know, I, um, uh, apart from what he said, he, he said all the positive things. So let me tell you something that may not be so positive. As you know, I, I live and work in London now, and with some uh, short breaks in uh, Cyprus, I haven't been to Greece very much since uh, COVID. So um, don't uh, go too deep into Greek things <laughs> because I may not. <laughs> I may not know them. What I'm going to do is to go through the main issues, uh, discuss what um, we see, you know, with the help of my uh, of, of my co of my colleagues on the committee. Uh, as you know, the committee was formed in in in, um, in 2019. Actually, I even got the date wrong. Um, and I uh, have Kostas Megir, Dimitri Vayanos, who is here, and uh, Nikos. Vetas, who is the head of uh, UVA in Greece and uh, has access to all the data that, that we've used. Uh, we published a report in Greek, um, which is now available in English, by the way, will soon be published by CPR as an e-book on their uh, series it's called The Growth Strategy for the Greek Economy. And um, what I want to review today is to ask how, what has been achieved, what the uh, uh, implementations have there been, and uh, what challenges remain, or for the, or what should the newly elected uh, government uh, be focusing on? And I should say that uh, although I'm talking here on on my own, the, uh, it's, it's it's a joint uh, effort. You know what I'm going to say. Also, uh, 
there's a lot of input from the other uh, members of the committee. Dimitri Vajanos was at the LSE, unfortunately he couldn't make it today. Otherwise he would be here bailing me out if I uh, got something wrong. The um, topics I want to cover are, first of all, I'm going to give you a, a very, very brief summary of the economic situation in Greece in, in 2019. That's what we presented to the um, Prime Minister and his ministers related to economic policy at the time. And uh, that's what, and our um, report is geared to uh, uh, dealing with those issues that I'm going to uh, uh, outline in the beginning. Um, then I'm going to talk so about something that is not related to Greece, but, um, but you know, once a teacher, you're always a teacher. So that's what I would have said to my students if I was giving this uh, lecture to my students to be, to be careful when evaluating policies, uh, because there are a lot of um, misunderstandings, if you like, about the evaluation of economic uh, policy, and I, will, uh, and I will explain some things there. Um, then I'm going to go back to uh, the things that I point out where Greece was in 2019 and then ask where is Greece in 2022 and uh, are they different, Have, has there been any progress on the main targets that we identified back in 2019. And then I'm going to take various issues, individual issues and say what's been done about those important individual issues that were raised, what reason is to take action and what new challenges are there. So let's begin with the economic performance. Um, the, the worst feature, if you like, of the Greek economy that needed um, as a speedy correction as possible is that, uh, is that productivity, labor productivity was very low. Um, and that was reflected in uh, two indicators. The first is that uh, the participation in the labor force was very low. It ranked 25th out of the 27 EU members and investment was very low. In fact, it ranked the very last one of the uh, 27 members, and that includes, of course, these European uh, members. Um, and if you measure productivity in the usual way that uh, we, you know, just divide output by hours of work or by people employed, uh, it um, comes out as 22nd in uh, labor productivity the, the, the data, the latest data we had there was 2017, and in, and, and, and in a sense, you know, given that uh, um, that the European Union now has many members that were um, uh, controlled by the Soviet Union until 1990, whereas Greece had economic growth since the 1950s, it, it, this is not really performance to be proud of. You know, it's um, something needs to be done to, uh, for correction. Uh, I'm quite astonished that, uh, you know, as, I mean, as you know, I'm from Cyprus, so I go to Cyprus frequently, I know the economy there, and, and I go to Greece very rarely. When I go to Greece, I think, oh, you know, here is a country that is truly well developed, what a joy to be here, compared with Cyprus. <laughs> and, then, and then when I see Cyprus ranking above Greece in these official statistics, I think, my God, Greece must be in real trouble. <laughs> So that's why I put so much effort into writing uh, things there. But I guess familiarity breeds contempt, as they say. <laughs> that the longer you spend in, in our global countries, the more of the problems you see. Um, now, now, other uh, kind of negative statistics is that uh, Greece had a very low performance in new technologies. It was 20th in the EU index, which is called DESI. Uh, <coughs> of uh, technology. In, in my view, the worst economy, and, and, and also that of our, my colleagues actually, I would say, the worst economy of Greece is that, is that although it's a small economy in the European Union, it's basically a closed economy. Um, me, however you measure op openness with exports and imports, it, it comes out of 23rd as a percent of GDP in 2019. I mean, usually in economics, the first lesson we teach and of course, George is more of an expert on these things in, tr in trade and international finance than I am. It, it, the smaller the economy, uh, the more likely it is to be a small open economy. And there's a whole theory of small open economies, you know, especially when they belong to a big market. And Greece should be a small open economy, but it isn't. It's a small closed economy, which is rather uh, poor performance. 
Uh, it has low social support. In 2018, it was the third country that uh, the European Union identified as being in the most severe poverty risk. Um, and of course, it has very low environmental record. It's an embarrassment, in fact, the environmental record. Uh, how little care there is for the environment. Uh, now, what we suggested is that any reform should start with more investment. Everything possible should be done to increase investment in, in, in Greece. Uh, the business environment needs to improve, and if the business environment improves, then that gives you more investment. Labor force participation should increase because it, it, p people are qualified, there is good human capital, there is good education, so there is no reason why they should be idle. Um, the public sector administration should be more efficient to carry out uh, the things that the public sector does with respect to infrastructure and public goods. And um, if those four bullet points at the beginning, at the top, were satisfied, then uh, they, we would have more productivity, higher incomes from work, and uh, the poverty risk would be reduced. Labor, how do we increase labor force participation? Well, we should give incentives through tax and social insurance systems, including childcare services to encourage more women to go to work, more equal sharing of men and women on uh, home duties. You know, you can give tax incentives for that. We outline them in the report. Um, formal education and on-the-job training need um, re reforms as well. And the labor market focus should be on women and young people who have, that don't have uh, very good records in the labor market. High productivity would bring you more exports. Companies gain access to the large European market and grow. They enjoy economies of scale. They, um, but because the domestic market is small and there are no savings because of the state of the banks, to achieve those, you need to attract foreign investment through FDI. And of course, foreign investment is not attracted unless there is confidence that the country will do well. Um, that will also bring new technologies. I thought these slides were much smaller in number, actually. I'm sure we got to slide 11. I was still talking about the past. Um, and um, we're going to look at new technologies and what happened at last. Now, what I'm going to um, say next is to um, is, is what can you expect from Greece, given all those problems that I outlined before? You, you see, if you, if, if you think of the outline, and you probably know about them, otherwise you wouldn't be here, then it's, I mean, I hate to describe it as a failed state, but it, it, economically, it's, it, it's basically things didn't work, right? I mean, the, the, the state of the economy, given where it was then, is not, it was not any different from the state of Hungary, Czech Republic, even Romania, as <laughs> you will see there. Maybe, maybe about Bulgaria and Albania, actually, the statistics. So when you are looking at the adjustment, adju adjustments, economic adjustments that should take place in Greece to bring it up to the level of the European Union, you should think, how long will it take to, uh, to, to achieve that? And, um, and, and, and to achieve, you know, what I say, don't expect miracles because the, the view that people generally have about uh, e economic adjustments in economic policy doesn't quite match what economists know about uh, adjustment following reforms. And, that, and that's not only... Um, sort of the general public, if you like, the person in the street. It, it, it's also some academic economists. You know, it, it's quite shocking. In fact, the first time that um, I saw estimates there, it was in a meeting that even Joe Stiglitz said, uh, you won't believe how long it takes for an economy to adjust, so don't just recommend a, a reform and it would be achieved completely immediately. And, and look at this and that and the other. You see, look at Germany, for example. Germany in 1945, it, was, it, it destroyed the economy. You know, say it was like Greece in, uh, in, in, uh, 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 during the debt crisis. Um, Germany had a huge inflow of the guest workers to help it um, recover, and it had the Marshall Fund, much more than Greece got. You know, I mean, Greece was subjected to the German economic policies 
during the debt crisis. Germany had just American money just thrown into it. And yet, it took it, took it 23 years to reach the level of Britain in, uh, in industrial performance. You know, if it takes you 23 years, when you have all the, all, all the Turks and Yugoslavs and Greeks going to Germany to help, and you have all the American money through Marshall being thrown into your economy, Greece with uh, German fiscal austerity and no foreign money going in, it, it should take longer than that. Look at the collapse of the Soviet Union. The East European countries adopted free market economics in the beginning of the 1990s. Many became members of the European Union. 20 years later, they occupy the bottom positions in just about everything you want to look at still. And um, 32 years later, today, there are very, very small improvements. I mean, look at this. The, the red bars are the um, formerly planned economies that came under Soviet Union control. They're all at the bottom when it comes to labor productivity. They, it's difficult to revive the, these things. And then, of course, it's Southern uh, Europe and then Northern Europe. That's, that's 2022. Uh, look at GDP per capita. The red bars, again, of the uh, formerly planned economies. Then comes Southern Europe and then the Northern Europe here on the, uh, on the left. Of course, don't take uh, Luxembourg. Uh, this is 2011. And this is 2022. I mean, don't take Luxembourg and Ireland very seriously. The money doesn't belong to them, as we know. <laughs> like, Luxembourg, the money belongs to the Germans, and in Ireland, it belongs to the Americans. Um, and um, and, and the, the, this here, actually, the, this curve here is quite shocking, actually. It's not what we're talking about today. But look where the average of the European Union is. You know, this uh, yellow line. Let's have the whole of Northern Europe. I, I tell you, I mean, you have more to manage to squeeze in there. The, the right or not, Southern Europe and Eastern Europe. And that, that's just not sustainable for the European Union. It's a different story. My next lecture will be about that. The reason Malta is there is that they decided to copy Ireland and uh, Cyprus, especially Cyprus, actually low taxes, easy facilities, turn a blind eye to any money that comes in, any Russians welcome, you know. <laughs> um, and, and the difference between Malta and Cyprus, the reason it's further to the right, is that, um, is that Malta doesn't have to deal with, uh, with Turkey throwing spanner in the works, <laughs> especially in shipping, because uh, Malta is a very big shipping center. Cyprus cannot be because it, it ships with Cyprus flag are not allowed to sail through Turkish waters, and it's, it's just surrounded by it. But it's doing well otherwise. I mean, you know, that's how they're both close to the average of the EU. Again, the money maybe doesn't belong to them, <laughs> but not quite like Ireland and Luxembourg. So, so that's what I want to say. I mean, it takes long. Don't, don't expect miracles from Greece, especially this year, which is quite, it's quite depressing, actually. You only do that and you see further down. Uh, is, is, is Greece. I, I, I don't quite believe these uh, figures, but they came straight from the Eurostat website. Maybe those. That's the PPS adjustments for the. It's the P PPS adjustments. So, so life in Greece is expensive. <laughs> so you have mi mid level incomes and uh, expensive uh, life. In Greece oh, has well. higher prices than. Yeah, 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 yeah. If it's not PPS, then it moves up. But now it's behind Slovakia, Croatia, Latvia, Romania. Anyway, current performance. Um, the summary is that current performance is improving, but it's still low by European standards. Uh, it's, still, it's still the bottom country in many things in terms of, uh, or in investment at least, in terms of percent GDP. But, but things are improving. Uh, we said that that's the main thing that we should be looking at. The blue line is investment in Greece, and you can see that in 2019 it took a turn up. Uh, the difference between what's happening in um, in Europe in, in in the Euro in the Euro area as a whole, which is the red line, and the blue line, which is Greece, I showed you by the green line. You can see that the difference between them is going down. So it, it, in investment, it's doing well. Where it's doing better than investment, in fact, is in, the, is, is in openness. That I said is the most shocking statistic. And that shows in um, foreign direct investments. 
again, the blue line, in fact, in foreign direct investments, <coughs> it's now exceeding the average of the, uh, of, of the euro area. It's attracting more foreign capital. In fact, I do know an investment, I, I, won't, I won't mention the name, but an investment company that, that, that uh, uh, helps um, foreigners who want to invest in Greece. And they say that they just can't cope from the demand there is. And that's because there is confidence that uh, something is being done uh, well. So, and, that's this, and, and that, of course, is what's behind uh, this um, blue line rising here. It's, the, it's mainly funded, investment funded from abroad. The way foreign direct investment is defined here is that it's any takeover of a Greek company that, um, where the foreigners control more than 10% of the capital. Um, exports is the big uh, success that um, the, the average of the euro area, they're exporting about 55% of their GDP and, and Greece is now exporting close to 50% of its GDP. Uh, the difference is going down and down and, and it's growing rapidly. Um, when, when I look at uh, Greek exports, I'm quite, I'm quite shocked in fact, because I, I, it is, isn't the main Greek export uh, oil products? So the things that they import, cost and they export again. Uh, but still, you know, I mean, it's still they're still exporting some processes that took place in Greece and agricultural products. So the evaluation of the main things that we identified, investment and openness, is that yes, the country is becoming more open. Uh, yes, they're investing more, and progress is good given how slowly these things have an impact on the economy. Um, we cannot have complaints about that. I mean. Now, if you look at um, employment and productivity, they are still low by European standard, standards. You, uh, female employment, employment by women, uh, is still low. Hours flexibility, part-time employment is low. Um, performance in the labor market, actually, <laughs> wearing my labor economics hat, is, is, is really not good. The, the, that should improve. And uh, you, you can see that here, um, here is the rank of Greece amongst the 27, and over there is the performance. When it comes to overall employment, uh, Greece is 26th, only one country is below, which I think it's, uh, I think it's Italy actually, it's very low anyway. Um, now, when you, say, when you show that to people, they say, ah, yes, but if you look at employment of men, it's very high, whereas it's women that is bringing the average down. But in fact, that's not the case. It's 23rd in the employment of men, only 77%. The, these are ages 20 to 64. In, uh, in, 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 the, in the countries of the north, men, men aged 20 to 64, there's something like 90% employment, not uh, 77 um, the employment of women, of course, is, uh, is well below. No, that, no that's where Italy it, 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 Italy is the only country that has lower female employment than Greece. But, it, but, but women in the labor market in Italy is the big puzzle. They don't have children, they don't have jobs. Uh, what do they do all day? <laughs> and, um, and, 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 and it might be actually the most um, the most shocking statistic of Greece is that hours per employee, Greece is number one in the European Union. I mean, they, I mean Greeks, Greeks who have jobs work much longer hours than any country in the European Union. I, I, I think that's wrong. I'm against the law of work. <laughs> the main thing is to have a job, but you shouldn't be just working all the time 24-7 on that job. You know, I mean, there, there are good things in life that you should be enjoying with the money that you make. And yet, you know, I mean, they work 40 hours a week on average. Part-time work is very low, only 8%. Uh, and labor productivity is, is halfway there because of the, uh, you know, 74% of the EU because the East European countries, I was saying, is so, they're so un unproductive. Um, I'm, I'm quite serious, actually, about hours of work. In fact, my main uh, project now that I'm doing is one funded by NAFI Foundation on the Future of Work and Wellbeing. And when you see, you know, I'm, I'm, very, I'm becoming more and more interested in, on the well-being of workers rather than do they have a job, do they not have a job, and how much income do they get. Because when you see service of workers, how do they feel about their work, they care a lot more about conditions at work other than income. Once you, ha once you have a kind of 
satisfactory level. It doesn't matter if you, if you don't earn as much as Elon Musk or something. You know. um, and, uh, and, and when you look at that, having, having a small number of people working and working long hours is, is not conducive to uh, making you happy at work. You know, you, you need you need to spread work more evenly, and that's where where Greece is is failing. Um, now you can see that employment population, as I was saying, that the uh, that the, the average of the uh, of the EU is about seventy seven or something. Greece is sixty six. It's it's it, it is improving actually if you look at the pink line, but uh, not as much as we're hoping. So. Um, there's been a movement in the right direction, but the rankings of Greece have not changed since 2019. The, the prospects look good if present trends continue over the next decade for toilet for women. I don't know why I've been so positive, actually, when I look at it now with a new light <laughs> in the public. <laughs> it doesn't look as positive as I thought then. Um, but, uh, but Greece does need to find a way of reducing hours of work per person. Uh, also, also full-time workers work longer in Greece than full-time workers anywhere else in Europe. Uh, full-time workers in Greece work on average 42 and a half hours a week, whereas in Europe it's below 40 hours. I just, uh, I mean, uh, two, two hours a week more is, 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 is quite a lot. Imagine what we can do with two hours of leisure. And, uh, but, but especially, it needs to find more flexibility in hours to enable better work-life balance. When you, uh, when you see surveys of workers of, of, of what, what, make, what do workers want most from work, n n number one, they want um, transparency, a good communication with uh, line managers and with, uh, and with colleagues, you know, friendly relations at work, conversation that they know what's going on. And, and number two, they want uh, hours flexibility. So if they have a child at home that is uh, not well, if, if school calls and says your child is not well, you can immediately leave. And the employer says, of course, by all means, come back tomorrow. Um, that if you are not feeling well, you stay home, and so on and, and so forth. And that's, and that's what's not present in, in, in Greece. So the labor market reforms are needed. Now, let's take some individual cases. Oh good, I'm on time. Um, now th this one here is, uh, I have to get, get into the picture of, um, the, the way we wrote the report is that we had a list of about 30 people who specialize in the different sectors of the economy. And we asked them, you know, what do you think is needed there? That, and then we evaluated what they said to us and we put it in the report. We went back now and asked, um, I say we because uh, my colleagues in Greece uh, did, did that, and, and asked similar people, you know, what's been done uh, there given that the government is saying that it's applying our program and how much progress has, has been made. So let's begin with the, with the digital economy. Of course, it's essential and we emphasize that Greece needs a good digital infrastructure and, and it needs to um, uh, digitalize public services and uh, and, and big companies, and, because that would improve productivity. Now, there have been several reforms in the, in the right direction, but on the, on the Digital Economy and Society Index of the European Union, DESI, it still ranks 25th, only one country is below. It's, it's Bulgaria, actually, I think. Um, I said public sector digitalization is especially poor, but um, it, it's, it's poor on the big things, but it's done quite well in some small things, I'm told. You know, like you could, um, you could do some small jobs that you had to do with the public sectors by visiting ministries before. You can do them at home through the internet. Like, um, what's, a, what's it's the... It's certificates. Uh, it's of your own in, 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 in Cyprus, you know, like if you want to certify documents and all that, they can be done online which is quite something, in Cyprus you cannot do that. There are people who specialize in those and they have a very strong trade union, so they're not allowing the government to, to digitalize. The WID is women, women in the digital economy. Uh, it's doing slightly better with women, it's 20th. 
But uh, the, mo the most shocking statistic I saw actually of Greece, looking behind these uh, statistics, that uh, is, the, is, is by far the bottom country in the European Union, is, is how many people have never accessed the internet. Something like 21% of Greeks have never accessed the internet. So what do they do in their spare time? <laughs> 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 Maybe George will enlighten us about this. In, if, in Britain, it's only 7%, and they ask the question, and, and, and I, I actually saw you, they said 7% of British people have, an, have never accessed the internet, so how can they live? <laughs> like, and, but in Greece, it's, it's 20. I mean, it is, it is high, I'm surprised. Um, now, the digital upgrading is progressing well, there is a good ecosystem. You know, there's creation of technology parks, there's more funding from, from, the, from government resources. Um, there are tax incentives for the tech companies to establish, and they are becoming larger and get better valuations on stock markets. And of course, you know, there are some highly celebrated uh, foreign company establishments. I think Microsoft was one where even the prime minister went out uh, to to, to welcome Eric Schmidt, from what I remember. Um, now, there's a survey by, by this annoying, rather name of this company, Found.Asian. <laughs> it's a digital company in Greece that collects uh, uh, statistics and does an annual, it's been doing an annual survey for six years. I think, they're, I, I think their uh, surveys are quite good, actually. Um, they, they, when they survey companies, 75% of companies they survey say that they have adopted some kind of digital technology. When in Britain, we did a similar survey in Britain, and it's something like 80% of British companies in Britain. So it's not, I mean, 75% is a good number. What you might, the only thing that you might say, what is that really technology is that, is that most of them, the digital technologies that are adopted, most of them is Zoom is to do remote communication during COVID. At least they do, at least they do it though. You know, I mean, it is digital. Zoom is a digital technology. <laughs> um, and the, um, now, the now, now, now this last bullet point is what I was saying below before that, that what's important at work is that you should tell workers what you are doing. You know, you, you should have transparency at work. What, in Greece, what the foundation survey has shown is that although there are employers who care and they give training and, uh, and they upgrade, they are upgrading the technical skills of their workforce, there is no engagement of the, work, of the workers as to what's going on and there is no um, familiarity. They are not familiar, they don't tell the workers, they don't tell them, oh, you know, <clears throat> come and we'll have a chat about our plans which is how a good company, good company should be working. In other words, the workers are, are still not treated as stakeholders of the company. They are treated as a cost item, and, um, and the better trained the cost item is, the lower it is per unit, obviously, because the human capital goes up, and that's the typical response. And, uh, and credit to the foundation uh, people that, that pointed it out, that this is not the way to, to progress fast. You know, you should, Change now. Here is some some data that I got on startups that is related to that. This one here is the number of startups um, that um, have operations in Greece. The number is increasing. I mean, something happened in 2019. Maybe lots of them related to COVID or something. I don't know. Um, the, the number is doing well, but the money that is going into it is not so good. It's um, it was very high. Something happened, actually something happened in funding in 2021, maybe one or two that attracted a lot of funds, but I couldn't find what it was. But 2022 is down, and what, I'm really, what really surprises me is 2023, now the YTD just means year to date, but 2023 is you know, three quarters of it is out. It's unlikely to reach the levels of 2022. So although more and more people are interested in starting companies, digital companies, high tech, which is what this here shows you, the venture capital that goes into them uh, is not performing very well, which again will have to come from abroad in some way or, or, or other. Now, the environment, I think that's the most disappointing of, of all. 
There is one encouraging statistic about the environment in Greece, which uh, I hope I read it correctly because it surprised me. About half of electricity is generated by sustainable sources. Is that true? Yeah. You find it plausible? Yeah. Good. Well, at least I know how to read it. <laughs> how to read Greek and translate. <laughs> Um, but, but everything else is disappointing, though. Greece keeps breaking the rules and gets fined for its non-compliance with EU directives related to um, Nature 2000. Waste management is terrible. They get fines. Cyprus get fined all the time as well, actually. Don't, so you're not alone. Uh, you <laughs> um, it's in that, that, that is the disappointing here, actually. The third one is investing more on extraction of natural gas than any other EU country. And of course, Cyprus is investing an awful lot in extraction, in, in, in extraction of natural grass, which I disapprove, but who would listen to me? <laughs> uh, and, uh, and, and the other thing is that th there are a lot of um, uh, cases where uh, Greeks, the ordinary Greek construction or whatever, they break EU environmental law, um, but there isn't enough policing and not enough uh, penalties given by the government, so it, it, in, in the end, the country as a whole ends up paying fines to the European Union for breaking the rules, <clears throat> whereas these things need, you need to be very strict about those rules, about those things. Labor, some good things happen. Taxation and salary work has been lowered, which is what we said, because they should encourage salary work. VAT hasn't been raised to compensate. A pension fund has been created, something that there was strong opposition in Greece, but they created one. The only criticism you can make of the pension fund is that um, it's in state hands. And do you trust the government to uh, look after your pension? <laughs> it would have been much better if it was given to private hands. Obviously, this government will do it because they established it. They're going to look after it. But a future government, if it runs out of money, they might say, oh, I'm going to borrow some money from the pension fund and uh, restore it later. And then they lose the election and never, uh, nothing happens. It, it's a common practice. It happens all the time in Latin American countries where I went to Colombia and Chile where we discussed it. They said that's the problem with pension funds there. They are big, but they are controlled by the government. That's the only criticism I can make. Um, there is an improved structure of transfers. It should be encouraging the participation of more women, although it hasn't yet. Now, this one is a little bit uh, controversial. Uh, what they've done in education. Um, it, it, per the performance is poor when you see it in practice. If, now, in preschool, um, we, we strongly believe, as labor economists, that preschool education is extremely important. You know, before, in fact, James Heckman, you know, one of the heroes of labor economics, believes that. Uh, if you don't get preschool education right, you will never learn anything in your life. <laughs> it's, it's, and it's been quite influential work. So we, we, we encourage them to um, uh, introduce preschool uh, initiatives and education involving parents as well. But, but nothing has, has happened. UNICEF, in fact, has been highly critical of Greek preschool education. They've been convinced by Heckman as well. Uh, but, they, but their criticism has had no effect. They said some horrible things, actually, about, uh, about Greek children. And, and since I'm also a father, I don't like, I'm not going to repeat them. <laughs> um, there is, um, the, the problem is that there is government reluctance. And uh, the, 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 these are not my words, but I, it's come from us, from our committee. <laughs> there's reluctance, there's conceived maneuvering, there's bureaucratic sclerosis when it comes to preschool education, resistance to any childcare establishment. There's resistance of the childcare establishments uh, which stalled any project to, uh, to reform. Now, at the higher level, they establish university councils. Now, generally, university councils are a good idea, but only if they're independent from the university. Whereas the ones they established are not independent of the university. The rector of the university is, is the head of the council. So all they've done is to create another layer of bureaucracy at uh, universities. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm involved in a, in a completely independent council at the University of Cyprus. It works very well. There is no, no, no one from the high administration of the university is a member of our council. 
um, and we make recommendations to the high administration. This doesn't happen in Greece because you know, it's, it's the high administration of the university that's heading the councils, which is a shame, really, because they, some very good uh, scientists join some of the councils. And, and it's just there seems to be unwillingness from the educational community to accept reforms, and that is difficult to overcome. I am finishing two minutes. Two minutes. Or, well, I want to say something about the public sector. Nothing much is happening. Senior civil servants are still appointed by the government in power, and the performance evaluation criteria are ineffective, exactly as we have in Cyprus. Bureaucratic inefficiencies showed up in recent crises, such as uh, the train accident, the fires, which are probably due, most likely due to poor electricity connections, the floods, the government, the public sector didn't respond quickly and deal with the problems quickly. It did very well with COVID, actually, we should say, but not this. And there seems, and I think the problem there, we think the problem is that there is unwillingness of the government to give up this strong stronghold that it has on the public sector. We need a more independent public sector that would be more effective, but it doesn't, but the government doesn't seem to be willing to, to let it go and uh, develop on its own the way it's done here. Uh, for example, should I should I stop? I'm very so keen on very agriculture. Quickly, yes, no, I made definitely. Strong, I, I, I made very strong recommendations about agriculture. Unfortunately, I failed. Exports are increasing, but the the, the, the big problem of Greek ag uh, agriculture is that they have very good products. I, I mean, you know, it's it's a country that has the best agricultural climate in in, in Europe. It, it, it's warm and it's got sunshine. And all that, and they and they produce a lot of things, but they don't have the branding. You know, like I said, why can't you be like Italy? You know, it, 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 Italy succeeded so much with agricultural branding. You get people throughout the world saying, "Oh, Italian food! Yes, we must get Italian food. Italian olive, you know, best. Italian mozzarella, or something." You know, they go on and on and on. Well, at least Greece succeeded with feta. Actually, no, it's not quite like it has the branding of mozzarella, but it has it. In Greece, it doesn't have it. So they produce these amazing olives, much much better olive oil than the Italian, because it's thicker, it's stronger, better color. And, you know, I, I think the worst olive oil you can buy is the one from Luca. Is <laughs> Luca in um, Tuscany? It, it, it's like water. <laughs> and, and, and what they do is that the Italians come and take the, the, the olives and they process it and then they sell this Italian olive oil. I mean, and, and they, now who gets the most value? The, the Greek olive oil producer that gets peanuts to replace his olives? <laughs> or, or the Italian who puts it into fancy bottles and, and sells it to waiters or something as Italian olive oil that has all the value added? And it's so simple to do. I just can't get over it. I get angry when I think about it, so let's move on. <laughs> so in summary, then, what the new, the new challenges are that um, although Greece has been subject to unfavorable shocks and inflation and other one-offs, as we know, um, it does need to introduce more flexibility in labor markets and public sector. Um, there are threats from abroad in the, Euro the European recessionary uh, trends are worrying. You know, Germany is not doing well, and I think, I think Germans have to reform. Otherwise, who is going to drive Europe uh, forward? But it looks like uh, uh, German output is going to shrink in 2023. They cannot cope with uh, Chinese uh, uh, competition. Um, then, of course, you have Ukraine, Russian uh, <coughs> sanctions that is affecting Greece. Higher interest rates. But uh, they do need to raise uh, productivity and, uh, and um, uh, labor force participation. The, we need more flexibility, as I said many times, so let's not repeat it because my time has run out. Uh, government has a strong majority. You should just put through unfavorable reforms. So generally, some good things have been done. Be charitable because it takes very long to adjust. And there have been some adjustments in the right direction, especially openness and in investment and in foreign direct investment. Um, but um, do something about the public sector, make it more independent. Uh, don't have it so much 
political influence and break up that educational establishment that uh, is stopping Greeks from getting as good education as they can get by coming to the LSE. Ah, yes. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. And what a fantastic point to, to finish with. I said we're going to finish at 8, but I appreciate that we want to take a bit of time for, for the discussion. So we're going to uh, stay a bit behind after 8, maybe 10 minutes past 8. But I would ask George to keep to the initial plan uh, and, of uh, 10 minutes. Remember, don't bite the hand that fed you. It's always back to Aesop, you know? <laughs> Okay, first, first of all, let me thank you all for being here. Let me thank the Hellenic Observatory for inviting me to discuss this very interesting presentation by Chris Pisaridis. Uh, some of you may not know that I, I know Chris Pisaridis for the best part of the last 45 years, or probably more, uh, as, a, as a tutor, as a university as a PhD supervisor, as a co-author, as a landlord, <laughs> as a friend <laughs> throughout those 45 years. So, so, so let me, let me uh, say that I have uh, very little to disagree with. Uh, the Pisaridis report uh, was a very, very important report for, for Greece. Uh, it suggested the number of priority target areas as uh, as uh, Chris reminded us uh, right now, such as a rise in labor force participation and investment rates and improvements in the business environment, education, training, the public sector. And in his uh, update tonight, um, Chris Pisaridis has reminded us what was proposed and uh, has given his assessment of the progress. I think it was a very generous assessment for the Greek <laughs> government. Um, uh, I'm almost in full agreement with, uh, with uh, the main elements of the Pisaridis report and also with his remark that we cannot expect structural reforms to work very quickly because structural reforms take a long time to, um, to bear fruit. Uh, for example, he stressed that it took almost 18 years for the German economy to catch up with Britain following the reforms of the early 1950s. Um, however, the lags in the effectiveness of uh, structural reforms suggest that their speedy adoption ought to be a key priority. And in the case of Greece, it ought to be a key priority for the newly elected or newly re-elected Greek government. Because if structural reforms take a long time to bear economic fruit, then it is even more important that they are ad adopted as quickly as possible and as widely as possible. Um, now, because of the pandemic and the deep recession that it produced, but also because of political considerations, the Greek government has not been too active in adopting the Pisaridis Committee recommendations. Very few of the recommendations have actually been adopted. Um, the new Greek government, which was re-elected with uh, a very strong mandate, ought to overcome the political obstacles to the adoption of these reforms and move much more quickly than in the past. Now, we all understand that there are a number of political disincentives in, uh, to the adoption of structural reforms. You know, I have been a politician and I have experienced them firsthand. Uh, a key obstacle for politicians is that structural reforms such as the ones suggested by the Pisaridis Committee have a long gestation period, which means that their political benefits appear in the future, possibly in the distant future, 
where the political costs in the form of the disruption of the status quo are borne by governments almost immediately. And this is not only the case in Greece, it is throughout Europe, throughout the world. Because governments have a tendency to postpone the adoption of structural reforms to avoid the political costs associated with them in the short run. Now, the new Greek government is uniquely placed to break this vicious, vicious circle. It won a second term with an enhanced majority, something which is unprecedented in the case of Greece since the restoration of democracy in 1974. It faces an opposition which is in almost total disarray, so it has virtually no opposition, um, equally unprecedented, and uh, has been elected on the basis of a reform agenda. So no other government has had these benefits since the restoration of democracy in 1974, and I think that there are very few excuses for the current government not to proceed very quickly with structural reforms such as the ones proposed by the uh, Pisaridis Committee. Now, since this, uh, I will not go back into the nature of those reforms. They were explained you know, very, very, very well, and I think most of us understand their importance. What I will try to do in the remainder of my time, five minutes or whatever, is try to look at what are the medium-term prospects of the Greek economy uh, as, we, as we speak. Um, the medium-term prospects of the Greek economy, the only international organization who looks at the medium-term prospects is the International Monetary Fund. They are um, bold enough to make projections over five-year periods. So I will talk a little bit around those projections. Um, because the medium-term prospects of the Greek economy, despite the fact that the Greek economy uh, recovered very, very quickly and very strongly from the recession of the, caused by the pandemic, the medium-term prospects are not so good. They are positive, but not so good. Um, for the five-year period 2024-2028, the projected average annual growth rate of GDP is only 1.4%. Even in 2028, the real GDP of Greece will only stand at 211 billion euros of 2015, in, in real terms, that is, versus 240 billion euros at its peak in uh, 2007. You can see it in the, in the, in the graph that I have presented. Uh, 20 years after the twin crisis, uh, that is in 2028, according to these projections, the real GDP of Greece will be 12% below its peak in, 2000, in 2007, which is not a very satisfactory outcome. Germany recovered in uh, 18 years. Greece will not have recovered after 20 years, given the, these projections. And of course, uh, per capita GDP, is uh, the gap is going to be smaller, but it's still going to be about 6.5 percent of, uh, of, of, of the, uh, when you compare 2007 and uh, 2000, 2028. So this is uh, a reason for speeding up reforms in order to speed up economic growth, because economic growth is not projected to be very satisfactory. Uh, if you look at uh, unemployment, unemployment is expected to fall in 2028 to 9% of the labor force, which is still higher than unemployment in 2008, just before the crisis. Uh, again, this is not a very satisfactory outcome. Although unemployment has fallen impressively from the heights that, uh, that it uh, uh, hit after, during the, during the, the crisis to in 2010 and 2011 and 2012. Inflation is, is going to be fine. Uh, there was a, a, a temporary blip in inflation, like in the rest of the world, but inflation is, is predicted to go back to, 
to 2 percent. But the really worrying statistic is the evolution of the current account deficit. The current account deficit, I will remind you, was one of the, the key proximate factor be, behind the crisis of 2010. The fact that Greece had had, had, was running very high current account deficits uh, it, from the time that it started, that it uh, um, joined the euro area until 2010. And these were uh, tackled, they were reduced, but the, during the pandemic, the current account deficit increased significantly, as you can see in the picture, and it has remained high um, throughout until today. Um, for example, it peaked in nine, at 9% at of GDP in 2022. It is projected to fall to about 8% this, this year and keep falling, but it will not be below 3% of, of, uh, of, of GDP by 2028. So Greece will be accumulating a lot of external debt in the next few years, and this is, this is one of the, of the problems. So in uh, the medium term, I will finish. In the medium term, the problem of strengthening the economic recovery by improving the international competitiveness of the Greek economy, <coughs> as well as the problem of a, a rapid de-escalation of public debt, which is still quite high, although falling, it is still quite high, um, are the two key priorities. And, uh, uh, and Greece the, will, you know, part of the, of the policy will be other parts of macroeconomic policy, not structural reforms, but structural reforms are key if we want to see an acceleration of economic growth, which will help both the restoration of competitiveness and the increase in productivity and the de-escalation of, of foreign debt. So the, the problem that the Greek government has uh, for the next two years is to achieve a significant acceleration of economic growth while simultaneously improving the international competitiveness of the economy. Higher economic growth relative to current projections will also lead to a faster de-escalation of unemployment and the ratio of public debt to GDP. And for this, we need bold reforms like the ones contained in the Pisaridis Committee report. And the election result, which was so positive for the current Greek government provides a historic opportunity for the government and for the country. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, George. Um, I think uh, we, I don't know if Chris wants to, to respond on on something uh, that... No, no, it's fine. We're yeah. place, okay, so in that case, while you collect your thoughts and I see the, the intentions in the room for questions, let me kick off with uh, one question of my own. Um, the, the report did, did not have, uh, did not allow much space on the world industrial policy. Uh, and, and that is... Uh, um, in, in some way going against the, the, the wave of, of an increase in, in attention in industrial policy, both in academia, but also the European Union. Uh, Germany never had an industrial policy, well, they have now. And of course, the European Union never did, and they have, or they call it industrial uh, policy now. But also even, you know, I mean, I understand that was 2019, 2020. But after that, the European Union also came with a, a proper uh, mission and agenda in the form of the twin transition, the, the green and digital uh, uh, agenda. So, uh, you know, whether Greece wants it or not, they will have some sort of industrial policy because they have to follow the green and digital agenda. Do you think that, you know, this is something that can take us beyond the narrative of reforms and closer to what Mazzucato calls directionality of growth, creating missions, so in a way directing the economy um, to places where you want to excel, be it in uh, export of, of uh, you know, agri-food with higher value added, or be in STEM sectors, or, or whatever. Uh, is this something that, as the Commission, you know, if you were writing the report today, you would uh, 
pay more or not more uh, attention to that, the directionality, selecting sectors, and so mm -hmm. forth. Well, well, you know, I mean, you're right that we didn't talk about industrial policy very much going beyond what the European Union uh, requires with the, with the green uh, transition and the basic standards that need to be satisfied that they are, you know, there cannot be subsidization by the public sector and, and so on. It, I mean, you're as, I mean, as you know, I'm not, I'm not an, an industrial economist, but being a sort of, a sort of economist generally, I, I've always has, had doubts about industrial policy and, um, and how much it should in, intervene. You know, like, I mean, it, to, to give general guidelines as to where industry should be heading, you know, in terms of, uh, of, of the environment, for example, or in terms of um, uh, products of high value added, or and, and what the government needs to do to to encourage, you know, if you take agriculture, what government needs to do to encourage uh, branding, which is basically to, to to get bigger units, it's because units are too small. The most great producers are too small to to go up to brand themselves, so the government needs to to, to brand. Them. You know, apart from that, I always thought. Entrepreneurs and industrialists know better about what's good for their industry and their sector than the government ever does. You, you, you don't find so, you know, the benevolent dictator, as you were, who would know what uh, needs to be done and, uh, and do it. So let, let them do it on their own. That's, that's the view that I have always taken. And can I ask uh, Professor a, a question? So I, had, I was in Greece, uh, I mean, I go to Greece occasionally. Uh, <laughs> so um, I was in discussions with people, you know, actually putting on, on that point that you need bigger firms, you need more people to be employees as opposed to self-employed or working in very small or family businesses. Uh, because the, the big employer will also provide more training for human capital, you will have promotion opportunities, otherwise you're just stuck in small jobs by small employers. Um, and, and you mentioned that the, the, the government did not adopt, you know, most of the recommendations of the Commission have not been adopted yet, uh, at least. So we always complain about governments and policies, but is there something in, in society, you think, that there's no demand for, for these reforms as opposed to no supply of reforms by the um, political establishment? Well, yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to tell. I mean, it's... Uh... Clearly, you know, the status quo is something that the Greeks have adopt, adapted to, and they, they don't, many Greeks do not want change. Uh, but, but, but clearly for the, for the economy to flourish in the future, they, the economy has to become more open, for example. If the economy be, were to become more open, it means that mo most, much more of Greek production should be uh, for export. You know, production for tradable goods and services. I mean, tourism is one sector, but you cannot rely just on tourism. Um, if, 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 the Greek, if Greek firms could be induced or pressurized to produce for the European market, then their size will increase, because the European market is a large market. The Greek market is a relatively small market. So, so I think that, that the key to, 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 a, to a, a faster recovery is, is to concentrate on, on, on supporting the, trade, the sectors producing tradable goods and services. I mean, that's the key. All kinds of policies, not just structural reforms, all kinds of policies, tax policy, um, uh, Subsidies to the to the extent that you can use subsidies for regional policy should be also going to to tradable uh, industry industries producing tradables, um, and that's that's for, for me is the key because uh, because I agree with with what Chris said that Greece is is a relatively closed economy it produces too much of the production in Greece is production of non tradables services for the domestic market essentially. Thank you. Okay, let's open it up. I'll take one question. Bernard, please identify yourself and ask a question as opposed to give a speech. There's a microphone coming. And please indicate if you want to ask a question. 
Thank you, Vasilis. Thank you. Um, Bernard Casey, once at this place recently at the University of Adelaide. Um, I'm an economic demographer. Um, I wondered if you could comment upon the demographic structure of Greece um, about aging populations. Retirement was briefly mentioned. Greece's retirement age relative to other European countries, is it too high or too low? Are there too many old people in the workforce and is that a good thing or a bad thing? And are there in fact too few young people in the workforce, partly because one is losing them abroad? Did you comment at all about this in terms of prospects and where we are going? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, it's a problem. There's no doubt that it's a problem. There, there is population aging. There is very, there's very low growth of population. In fact, when we're writing some, um, some forecasts where that, uh, that by 2050 Greece would have a population of 6 million instead of the current 9.5 million. Um, and of course, the way that it's going to get there is, that, like what you said, it's, it's an aging population, very small birth rate, and, um, and, and migration, out migration of, of, of young people. Um, we talked actually about giving incentives for, uh, for, for increasing the birth rate, uh, your child, uh, child care, uh, preschool, the preschool education I was talking about involves a very big fraction of childcare. Um, be, beyond that, it, it, I, mean, the whole, I mean, the whole issue of migration is, um, is very controversial, of course, but, um, but we did write, especially Betas uh, uh, in, in Greece, he has one or two articles saying that, uh, you know, not, not mass immigration, because once you open the gates, then given its geographic location, it would get out of control. But small numbers which get um, integrated, and there is a policy of integration of immigrants, uh, would help, whereas currently there is no such thing. Um, the question is, what's the starting point of, of, of immigration? I mean, like, currently, what's the immigrant um, population in Greece? It might be 20% or something. Yeah, more that, more, more like 10%. Yeah, because it's about 20, 25 percent. Yeah, it's obviously smaller. Of, uh, yeah. yeah. Um, so we we consider all these options, but um, without any policy that would say this is what needs to be done. Do it. It's, it's, it's bits and pieces here and there. You did make reference to Germany and guest workers. I also come from Germany, and I was noting that in, in yeah. talking about what helped supposedly Germany over the 23 years. Yes. Well, the, it, it, you see, the guest workers is a, it's a way of managing immigration. I mean, that's what uh, that's probably what what they have. I'm not I'm not familiar with the, the details of. Um, Immigration policy, like like in Cyprus, they they do have four-year uh, contracts for a, a, a lot of them. A lot of them stay, but uh, most leave after the four years and they and they come back again later, which is which, which seems to work unless they are uh, unless you are a Russian, in which case you can stay forever. <laughs> Find a Greek to marry, and that's it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I, I put up this picture of, of uh, the evolution of Greek population. Essentially, Greek, the Greek population has been declining since 2010. Uh, and the decline, as you can see, is quite steep, um, which makes it, I think, even more important to focus on an increase in labor force participation, because women in Greece and young people have not been participating in the labor force as, uh, as much as in the rest of, uh, of Europe. Also, I think it is very, very important for Greece to focus on reversing the brain drain. Reversing the brain drain is going to be important. I mean, I, I know that 
there are some people here who are part of this brain drain. Uh, I mean, young people left during the crisis and the people who left were also high productivity people. So if, if, uh, if you could, uh, if you could uh, engineer a successful policy of reversing the brain drain, you would increase the labor force and also you would increase productivity because those who are returning have higher productivity than the rest of the, of the population. So it is reversing the brain drain, I think, will be even more important than increasing the labor force participation of women or, or young people uh, for, for productivity. So reversing the migration trends is, 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 is uh, very, very difficult, very, very long term. And uh, migration, controlled migration, uh, is part of the solution, but it's not the only solution. Let me interject. Uh, so here's a question because I remember, uh, you know, the reversing the brain drain is something that is, for, you know, Tsipras announced it, Mitsotakis announced it, uh, I'm sure whoever, you know, the many uh, prime ministers in the future will also announce it. But we were just talking about earlier saying that, you know, we, or, uh, you know, Chris was saying at least that, uh, you know, I don't trust governments to direct the economy. I prefer, you know, I believe the market can, the entrepreneur can. And, and, and it seems like, you know, with the, when it comes to brain drain, we have some sort of background understanding that there's a big market failure and, you know, that led people in the audience to come to London. Whereas uh, it isn't, it's probably like the market working well and, you know, there's better jobs, better job prospects here and in other places and that's why people came. So reversing the brain drain shouldn't just be that, you know, you, you create good conditions in the country and then people will come rather than try to orchestrate some sort of mega return uh, back home, you know. Sure. I'll leave it as a rhetorical it's not, question. It's not going to be easy. It's not going to be easy. <laughs> yes. That's yeah. for sure. Yeah. Okay, so we'll have a question. One from here, uh, one at the back, and then here. Thank you very much. Um, Alexandro Zachariadis, uh, research fellow in the IR department. Um, so, related to the question of population, Greece is still paying a very high percentage, if not the highest percentage of GDP in terms of pensions uh, on a yearly basis, I think 17%. So what is your suggestion in terms of, you know, lowering that, that figure uh, in the report, if there, is a, if there is a suggestion of how to ref reform that? And then in a more general sense, is there enough time to reform the economy before 2032, for example, when Greece will start to have to pay more in terms of its ESF, um, European Mechanism of Stability Repayments, uh, to, to do these reforms in time before it's trapped in another debt crisis, if it makes sense. Thanks. Let's take the second question. The gentleman in the middle. Thanks very much. Chris, you presented a uh, well, let me introduce myself. Uh, Emmanuel Tranos, Professor of Quantitative Human Geography, University of Bristol. Um, Chris, you presented, uh, you know, a, a picture of Greece which, you know, is not very bright, and, you know, most of us will agree with, uh, you know, what you presented. What I would be really interested in hearing is what are the key assets of the Greek economy that you think, you know, will help, you know, move forward uh, and overcome this not very bright mm -hmm. picture. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thanks. And a question again back at the front here. Thank you. Hi. Um, thank you. My name is Kira Garzo Katsuyani. I'm a postdoc at the Hellenic Observatory. Um, and I wanted to ask so I have the impression sometimes this government takes the kind of the recommendation to do everything to increase investment as a call to kind of attract foreign investment in real estate or to kind of you know, get people to big, big hotels privatized beaches, beautiful kind of, you know, so it, it links to the environmental point as well. And, you know, that, that's great in accounting terms, right? That looks fantastic in the books in the short term. But I guess, does it continue in the, in the long run to kind of the improvement of the social indicators um, that you shared? Or kind of do we need to take kind of a more directional approach, as Vasilis was um, saying earlier? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Um, on, on the first... If, the first question, actually, I mean, what, what was the 70% figure that you mentioned right in the beginning? If I can recall correctly, it's 
Seventy percent of pre-GDP went to paying pensions. Really. I can't remember. It might be one. Seven zero. No. Seventy. No. Seven zero. One seven. Oh, one seven. Yeah, I thought you said seventy. No, even one seven is too high, but it's it's very high. I think it's. That was twenty twenty. Yeah. Well, the first question was about the debt, so that's your yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I don't have any debts. Okay, let me, I mean, the question is first, first of all, what is there to stop a, a new crisis? Yeah. The way I understood your question is, uh, I think a new crisis is unlikely before the mid, the mid uh, thirties. Why? Because, um, because there was a restructuring of the Greek debt in 2012, and um, the Greek debt is, has been rescheduled at, with long maturities and low interest rates until 2032. So until, until 2032, there is a very small probability of a sovereign debt crisis again. Um, this does not mean that, uh, that we should be complacent about it. Because um, between now and 2032, we have to reduce our debt to GDP ratio significantly, which means that we have to run um, sizable primary surpluses. If I were to go back to the um, IMF projections, the IMF uh, projects that uh, in 2028, under its assumptions, that the primary surplus will be something like 2% of GDP, that the debt will be at 143% of GDP. Now it is 180 or something. 143% of GDP is much higher than before the 2010 crisis. So if we were to go to 2032 with high debt, they, the economy will start being vulnerable to sovereign debt crisis again. And um, that's why it's important that we do what we do to um, accelerate economic growth, but also in an environment of, of, of fiscal discipline. Um, so that's, 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 uh, that's quite important. Now, what are the good things about Greece, about the future of Greece? I mean, Greece has been at much worse junctures in the past, historically, if you think about it. I mean, after the default of, uh, of the late 19th century and the imposition of the International Financial Commission, everybody thought that, that the Greek state would disappear. Instead of disappearing, the economy was stabilized, then we fought the Balkan Wars, and instead of disappearing, the Greek state doubled its territory and its population. In, at the end of World War II, the economy was, was in, it, completely destroyed and, um, at the end of the Civil War. Still, you know, for 20 years, Greece was, was, was growing very, very fast because it, it did the right things. So I think that if we do the right things, there's a lot of, uh, of hope for the Greek economy. Chris? I, I, actually, I, I'll, give a, I'll give a more, a, a more specific answer. He, he reminds me so much, what George's answer reminds me so much of George Vassiliou, the former president of Cyprus, that right. whenever they said to him, oh, you know, it's a disaster, where are we going to not go? He said, we are very lucky. <laughs> he said, we are lucky. In, uh, in, in the 90s, it was a disaster. We didn't know what to do. Then Lebanon catches fire. All the rich Lebanese come to Cyprus. They brought their money. They saved us. <laughs> in the 1990s, disaster. Russia opens up. The Russians can't bring all the money. They saved us. So some, somebody's going to come and bring us money. <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 you know, on, on what Chris has actually is, is I'm, I'm very, I'm very Lucasian on that, you know, after Bob Lucas. It's, it's human capital. No, no country has a better resource than human capital. Oh, 
But each country, the fortune of each country is determined by its human capital. It, you know, I mean, the, there are countries that have enormous natural resources. You know, take, take uh, African countries. Mozambique is extremely rich in natural resources. It doesn't have human capital. I mean, look, at, look at its state. So the way for Greece to grow is not to say, oh, you know, we have natural gas or, or we have beautiful beaches which we have, and, and that's what we're going to develop. We say, we, we have a culture educated population. So what the government's role is, is to provide the right environment, the right institutional structure of the country for that education, for that uh, human capital spirit, the entrepreneurial spirit to flourish. And, and that's how you're going to get growth. I mean, look, Look at Japan, isn't that what, what they did after the war? It, it was destroyed, and a famous book that I never read, which is like, because it's about this thick, by Dower, you know, embracing, em, embracing defeat. It, that's essentially what they did. It, they had nothing. They had two atomic bombs thrown on them. They had no natural resources. They had, a good, they had good human capital. They provided the right environment, and within, um, 30 years, they were the leading industrial nation outside uh, the United States. Okay, and Chris also that, on the- That's what we need. So, uh, sounds like industrial policy, but I will leave it there. But can, 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 <laughs> can you say no, no, something say, on, the, no. on, the, on the investments? On, on, yeah. on foreign investment. I mean, I, I, I mean, you're right, although you're too negative, though. That's the, <laughs> some foreign investments go to destroy the beaches the coastline, and um, I, I recommend actually the, uh, a, a very recent article by Costas McGear in Catherine He, You know, he's got, uh, like most Greeks, he's got a, a house in an island. So every time he goes there, he has ideas how not to destroy the, his island's coastline. <laughs> not his island, but it's a, it's, it's a very good article that is based on our recommendations. There, I, I mean, there are ways of doing it. I keep writing myself about Cyprus beaches, which have been completely destroyed much more than Greece. <clears throat> it, it, it's, it's basically um, who, who, is, you know, who is regulating the, uh, the, the tourist development. I think, I think tourist development is, is the one that needs most regulation and it, and it needs it in conjunction, in conjunction with uh, the environmental uh, policy, climate policy. I pointed out that, that the problem in Greece is that there is no policing. It's a, similar, it's a very similar problem of what we have in, in Cyprus. You know, like you first go and build a completely illegal building without any license, and then over 10 years they threaten you that they demolish it and they do this, that, and the other, and eventually a license comes along. How it does it, I don't know. But I've seen it so many times. You, you, you need. That's why you need a good industrial policy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> I will take that as the as the turning point. <laughs> but 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 there is also but there is also foreign direct investment going to uh, lo lots of other good Greek companies that need to develop. Okay, uh, thank you very much. I promise we're going to uh, go a bit out of uh, schedule. We have by 10 minutes. I know there were more questions in the audience, but uh, I think uh, definitely one of our speakers has to leave quite uh, uh, soon. So we'll stop here. We promise to continue more on this debate. Uh, so stay tuned at more events at the uh, Hellenic Observatory. Our next event is uh, on the... Okay, so it's on the website, but we, will <laughs> uh, but we also plan events that we haven't announced yet, but quite big events in November. So definitely check out our, our website for more events and activities. So before we all go for the well-deserved glass of wine, uh, please join me in thanking our two speakers.